Chapter 21 The meeting had started like musical chairs. Jean-Claude, it turned out, wouldn't sit next to Bridget. Bridget, in turn, wouldn't sit next to Wilmer. Wilmer had gawped for a second at Slasher and scuttled away like a little white mouse. And then Slasher had fled from the finicky Frenchman, disliking his bow or his odor or both. And then everyone scrambled around in the office till Sue put a stop to it. Stop it, she said. Everyone stopped it and stayed where they were. Bridget and Spike settled down on the blotter, Sue on the table, Jean-Claude on the sill, Wilmer alone on the edge of a bookshelf with Slasher above him, and me at the Mac. Buster was late, but I started without him. Looking at Bridget, I said, Here's the bit. We'll be playing a game, and the game is called Truth. So if anyone lies, she gets twenty demerits and loses the kitten. The kitten? she said. Her brow seemed to lift in suspicious surprise. Oh, Sam, do you have him? My sweet little fluffer? He isn't your fluffer, Jean-Claude nearly spat. I said, Everyone quiet and let's start the game. I'll begin with a story, and later I'll ask you to answer some questions. Is everyone in? Everyone nodded. I started the game. All right, I said, nervously tapping my tail. On Friday, I said, in the afternoon, Mr. John O'Shaughnessy left his house at about... What time was it, Bridget? Four. She looked up at me, frowning. But why do you ask? I evaded her question. What mood was he in? He was terribly angry, she said. Uh-huh. I imagine he'd recently opened the mail. Her blue eyes widened. But how did you know? He went out of the house with a piece of that mail, and with one other item, a ballpoint pen. He'd opened a package of three on the desk and took one of them with him. She nodded slowly. You know what was in it? I mean, in the mail? She lowered her eyes. An eviction notice. You know where he went with it? Sam, she pled. Just answer the question. He said on the phone he was seeing his landlord to argue his case. And who is his landlord? She mumbled. You know. But I want you to tell me. It's Casper Gutless. Everyone gasped and then started to talk. I quickly looked at Slasher. The same Casper Gutless who rents Jimmy's store to him. Fat Mr. G. He owns about 17 blocks in the village and finds it amusing to throw people out. It was all in his bio. I clicked on the site with a map of his holdings. You see, I said, look. Well, he ain't throwing Jimmy out. Slasher stood up and then raked at the air with a talon-like claw. Jean-Claude shot a look at him. Slasher said slowly, I'll eat all his ankles and chew off his nose. You'll do nothing but sit here, I told him. Now sit. Slasher looked at me sideways, but stayed where he was. I swiveled to Wilmer. At four on Friday, you still lived at Gutless's. Yeah, that's right. You remember what happened there? Wilmer nodded. A fella came over and brought him the rug. The Siberian tiger. Whatever, he said. But the fella came early. He's not expected. He's supposed to deliver it way after dark. Only Gutless don't argue, you know what I mean. Like he gets all excited. He 
He's nuts for the rug. And you know who the fella was? Guy named Hench. A guy who's wanted, I told him, for trapping and trading in animals. Wilmer looked dim. So what? He said carelessly. What's it to me? I said, You're an animal, Wilmer. Yeah? Come out in the alley and say that again. Spike started laughing. The point was just proved. Get on with the story, Sam. What happened then? Then the two of them walked into Gutless's office. They started talking and bolted the door. I looked up at Wilmer, who angled his head. You been spying or something? A gazer monsieur is been using his talent to figure it out. Jean-Claude made a wink at me. Please to go on. So they're locked in the office, I said, and they talk. And then what, Wilmer? This other guy comes. So Kent does his Brit thing, you know what I mean? Like the, master is busy and can't be disturbed. So the guy don't like it. He says, I just called and he told me he'd see me. So he's ticked as a clock. So Kent does his Brit thing again, and this other guy muscles on past him and runs up the stairs. So Kent follows after and sits the guy down. In the room with the sofa, I said. The room that's in the front of the office. So how'd you know that? Well, I didn't exactly, I said, except that his idiot ballpoint was under the couch, and it started to figure. Spike cocked his head. I don't get this at all, he said. What figured? That Mr. O'Shaughnessy had to be there. That he had to have heard when the kidnap was planned. And Gutless admitted he planned it with Hench on Friday at tea time, whatever that means. And I figured it means about quarter to five. The office was closed, but the voices carried. O'Shaughnessy heard them and even made notes. On the back of his envelope using his pen. At some point or other, he got an idea, and he got up abruptly, dropping his pen, and he hurried on out of there. Then he went home. He got home at 5.30ish, Bridget agreed. I grinned at her. Thank you. I think that's the truth. And then what happened? Sue was all ears. My goodness, Sammy, so what happened then? Then, I said vaguely, then I'm not sure. Then he called information, Bridget chimed in. And he asked for the number of Beaumont Nursery, but something was wrong with it. Some kind of voice said the phone wasn't working, the circuits were down. And he slammed down the phone, and he started to pace. He kept pacing and pacing. First he was frowning and then he was laughing. He gave me a kiss and said, Bridget, Bridget, you live with a genius. And then he was cackling, and then he said, Wow! And he picked up his car keys and raced from the house. She nodded prettily. What was the time? It was 6.27. And how do you know? There's a nice little clock in the VCR. It's across from the sofa, and that's where I was. Did you know where he went to? She shook her head no. I had no idea where he went to at all. Oh, I know what you're getting at, Sam. You've decided he went to the nursery and stole little fluff. But I'll never believe that. He isn't a thief. And yet he returned around one in the morning and brought little Louie. She nodded again. There were more exclamations and noise from the crowd. It was Saturday morning, she said, when I woke, so I can't say for certain what time he arrived, but he did have the kitten, this wonderful, beautiful little black fluffer asleep on his bed. So it was O'Shaughnessy. Sue clapped her paws. But then how did Sebastian... I'm getting there. Wait. I paced on the blotter and turned to Jean-Claude. 
You told me Sebastian departed New York at about 7.30. Exactly, monsieur. And you'll stick with the timing? I certainly will. The radio said so, monsieur. Though I really believe in their weather, they do know the time. I looked over at Wilmer. So what about Hench? He looked back at me stupidly. What about Hench? The subject, I said, is what time did he leave? You expect me to know that? He glared at the crowd. What's wrong with you people? You still watching clocks? You know that it's 7.01 when you're hungry and 7.02 when you finish your food? Bridget glowered right back at him. La dee da, and I bet you don't even know how to tell time. I can tell that the rug merchant left before dinner. And what time is dinner? I said. Six o'clock. All right, there we have it. It's just as I thought. It's a three-hour drive to the Beaumont Nursery. Hench must have gotten there, say about nine, and staked out the nursery planning to strike. Only while he was waiting, O'Shaughnessy entered. O'Shaughnessy left just as Sebastian arrived. Only hold it a second. Spike waved his paw and then frowned concentration and looked at Jean-Claude. It was 7.30, you said, when he left. That's a whole hour later than everyone else. So explain to me, Sammy. You're saying O'Shaughnessy took a whole hour to kidnap the kid? But Sebastian was speeding, I said. Remember? He got that ticket at 3 before 10, and he got it in Wiggum, a mile from the farm. But forget about numbers. The point would be this, that Sebastian Beaumont saw John O'Shaughnessy stealing the kitten, or thought that he did. So he made a U-turn and followed him home, and then Hench, observing it, followed them both. Like he followed Sebastian, who followed O'Shaughnessy? Spike wasn't happy. It has to be so. It's the only explanation that makes any sense. Sense? Sue was angry. It doesn't make sense. It does if you'll listen, I said. She glared. I paced on the blotter some more and looked at the deadpan faces that circled my path. They neither believed me nor disbelieved me. They simply waited. I sighed and went on. So the two of them parked at O'Shaughnessy's curb, and they stared at his windows. Hench is a pro, so he must have been careful. I'll bet Sebastian remained unaware of him. Bridget, you're on. What happened on Saturday? Nothing at all. What I mean is, O'Shaughnessy slept until noon and then wrote like a blue streak till way after dark, and I played with a kitten. After a while, we were all getting hungry. At 7.06, she looked bullets at Wilmer. And just about then is when Mr. O'Shaughnessy went to the store. And then Jacques and Sebastian, I said, broke in. Jean-Claude grew indignant again, a thing he did very nicely, with Gallic aplomb. He jutted his jaw out and looked down his nose. I would beg your pardon, monsieur, and I'd ask you to tell me how Jacques was a part of this plan. He was driving the truck that said Beaumont Gallery. The way I figure, Sebastian phoned him, using the cell phone I found in his coat. Sebastian was sitting there, stuck in his car and watching O'Shaughnessy's, hour after hour, and he phoned up his brother and said, Come and help. Can you prove something different? His jaw went down and his eyes went with it. Alas, monsieur. If I have to be honest, I'd tell you truly that Jacques got a phone call and left in a rush. It was most unusual, closing the store in the middle of Saturday, taking the truck. He looked up at me fleetingly, 
shaking his head. They got in through the door, I said, using the trick of inserting a credit card into the lock. It's an old-fashioned lock, and it's easily sprung, but Sebastian's visa card seemed to get bent, which is how I discovered it. Kindly remember, I added, that Hench had been watching it all. I see what you're getting at. Spike looked alert. So he saw them take Louis and leave in the truck, and he followed the truck till it got to the gallery. That explains everything. Then he broke in, and the rest would be history. Well, not quite. There's the whole second half of it. Everything else has... A sudden commotion arose from the store. The clang of the mail slot, the clatter of feet, and a babyish mewing as Buster appeared with the little black kitten on top of his back. <laughs>